Welcome to episode 124 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. As always, I'm joined by Mary, the Canadian leprechaun whose rainbow always leads you to a pot of golden IPAs. I am merely a soggy bowl of lucky charms named Darren. Dia Gwit, Mary, and to everybody who's celebrating St. Patrick's Day. How are you doing today? <laughs> I should be able to speak Irish considering I'm three quarters Irish, but I have no idea what you just said. Uh, but I did love Lucky Charms as a child to the point who where... Who doesn't like Lucky Charms? I believe well, Diagwit is, is greeting. Oh, who knows? It's they Gaelic. got banned from my house because all I would do is I would eat the marshmallows and leave the cereal. So that my mom was like, this is a waste of money. No more. Not surprised. Not surprised anyway. All right. So yeah, so what's going on with you? It's been a couple of weeks since you recorded. Very excited to get back on this Irish holiday here in Boston. We're looking yep. forward to all that stuff. So before we get started, I am always a gracious host i will ask you but of course what are you drinking today mary i am drinking liquid vacation tropical ipa from lord hobo which is a local brewery here and i'm drinking it out of my sarah edmonds mug because um i know we're doing an irish episode about the irish brigade today but we're also recording on um women's day and oh. she is one of my uh she was a disguised herself as a soldier in the civil war she was did a bit of spying and she was also a nurse so i just wanted to have her as my mug for this episode oh, good good well that's very well well before before you would go happy international women's day to you mary and to everybody who listens there's a lot of great females out there who do history and uh sometimes at their own um at their own uh disregard and fortune social media but mm -hmm. you are you are all doing great work so congratulations to everybody who does that and to everybody international women's day that being said mary you got something to ask me don't you what are you drinking oh my god thank you so much it is i do <laughs> the luck of the irish today obviously i am drinking 617 lord hobo hazy ipa 617 of course is the area code for boston we're going to talk about boston a little bit tonight and i am not drinking out of a coffee mug mary i'm drinking out of my irish brigade beer glass because although i'm not drinking Guinness or anything Irish. It's not St. Patty's Day just yet. No. I must represent because that episode today, Mary, we are going to be talking about the Irish Brigade with the Feast of St. Patrick just a few days away. What a great opportunity to discuss one of the most significant and hardest fighting units in the entire American Civil War. That is, of course, the Irish Brigade. Now, from the war's beginning, right through Appomattox, 7,715 Irishmen from New York, Boston, even Philadelphia, um, carrying their green regimental flag. They fought to the death for a flag that wasn't even their own. We're going to talk about that. And to understand what you know, who they were and why they fought, it's really important to understand the plight of the Irish in the mid-1800s, a time when they were anything but lucky. See what I did there, nice. right? Yeah, they were very much like, so the majority of Irish immigrants that came to the United States, they had very little money, if at all, education, jobs, um, because a lot of them, when they came from Ireland, um, had been tenant farmers, and that was the same thing that they did here. And, but a lot of them did settle in cities, and the jobs were low-paying, living conditions were not great, and, um, you know, already settled here, U.S. citizens that have been here for generation upon generation did not like them. Oh, and much. that's that's the thing, you know, you got to look at their history a little bit from 1845 to the mid-1850s. The potato crop in Ireland became infested with fungus, causing 75% of the Irish potato crop to fail, leading to widespread starvation in the rural parts of Ireland. Now, despite this failing potato crop, um, Ireland was still a huge supplier of food to England, mm -hmm. who still naturally demanded the food from, from, from the Irish. So despite the fact that many within its country you know, were starving to death, they still had to send the food to the empire, which, as you can imagine, did not, did not go did so not well. This will well. be known as the Great Famine, and it resulted in over, over one million Irish leaving their home country and emigrating here to the United States, mostly to the northeastern cities such as Boston, New York City, and Philadelphia, right? Now, like you said, most of these Irish immigrants came from rural areas, mm -hmm. uh, and once they got to the United States, they had limited skills in the new world of, of industry that was here. So to make ends meet, uh, they took job, like you said, as laborers, uh, dock workers, basically any type of physical labor they could get, they yeah, tried like to get. Digging ditches, like just like, think of like the jobs that nobody wants to do. That's what the Irish were doing when they emigrated over yeah. here. I mean, you're talking about, yeah, dock workers, digging ditches, playing hockey with the maple leaves, all the jobs that nobody wants, right? Nobody wants to do that today. No, but these ones they have to do. But when you look at the influx of population, 
1860, Boston's population was 26% Irish. New York's was 25% Irish. Philly was 18% Irish. Even today, Mary, there are more people in the city of Boston of Irish descent than Ireland. That's, that's how much, how, that's how Irish, how green Boston is. That's in crazy. Chicago, they make the river green to pretend they're Irish. In Boston, <laughs> we're just Irish. So I was going to say, okay. the one thing that I, that, like I was thinking about when I was researching for this episode um, was the movie Gangs in New York, which we obviously mm-hmm. touched on in our episode about the draft riots, but that touches on how the Irish were treated at the time. Right. Um, and I think like um, Bill the Butcher, the guy that he's based off of, or at least in the, the you know, the movie um, that is part of like the know nothing political movement, the nativist movement that was happening in the U.S. at the time that there's this influx of Irish immigrants because of the famine. Um, but these nativists, um, they spread rumors about the Irish, including that there were dungeons under St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. Oh, yeah. Um, and that they were an advance guard of the this papal invasion that was going to happen now specifically within the Irish. Like you have, you know, the Irish Protestants, but you also have the Irish Catholics. The Irish Catholics were probably the most hated. Um, yeah. Of the exactly. Irish. And I don't know if you know this, Mary, but many in this country aren't very welcoming to foreigners no. to this soil. In, in, 19, in 1860, <laughs> that anti-Catholic Irish uh, Catholic sentiment you mentioned was extremely strong. No Irish need apply. That was a very popular mm-hmm. sign with companies looking to hire as these Irish flooded these northern cities in seeking of, of work because of what was going on in their home country. Now, this growing xenophobia in the north but to the creation of the Protestant Know Nothing Party, yeah. whose major focus was anti-immigration, and they targeted the Irish because of their allegiance to the Pope, mm-hmm. right? So this large influx of Irish who tended to look after each other, I mean, they're, you know, same country, they also created a large block of voters, which was going to be taken advantage of by the Democrats in that yeah. Tammany Hall political machine in New York City we talked about with the draft riots, that, that says it all goes hand in hand. Now, This situation is all what's taking place on the eve of the American Civil War with this abolition of slaves front and center in their minds. Because, Mary, if you're an Irish worker, you're having a tough enough time finding work. The concept of freed slaves competing with them and flooding the job market in the North is their worst nightmare by far. Yeah, because, you know, the Irish made very, very low wages, but... Um, the freed slaves would work for less and they did work for less, unfortunately. Um, but the Irish just were, they were fearing that because they were struggling enough to get jobs. So there's that happening. And you see that again, too, in in the movie Gangs in New York with the draft riots. And that's why they oh. target the African-Americans. Absolutely. This anti-Irish sentiment in the North was so strong that many considered Irish and slaves is almost the same. Mm-hmm. So for the, the end of slavery meant two lower classes competing for the same jobs in the, and the Irish knew it. So one advantage the Irish did have was they were allowed to serve in the army. And so many in New York City joined the state militia, which was a state-run militia, or like an organization that would train troops to join the United States Army in case there was ever a war. So, so whether to earn some extra money or perhaps maybe to gain some respect from, from their American neighbors, many of these Irish joined the militia. One of the leaders in the New York militia was a guy named Michael Corcoran, the man who's the phrase pro-Irish is the understatement of the century, right? Oh, yes. Corcoran, a little background on him, he was born on September 21st, 1827 in Carrowkeel, Ireland, and was the son of a British Army officer. Now, during the 18, you know, 1846, during the potato mm-hmm. famine, Corcoran is going to join the Revenue Police. This is basically a group designed to kind of go bust illegal whiskey distillers. Yeah. So really, Corcoran was kind of like the Irish Elliot Ness at this point. Yeah. That was his job. Now, he was also part of an Irish rebellion group called the Ribbons Men, mm-hmm. and, 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 and which excelled in all the fun, fun-loving stuff, mayhem and destruction, and avenging those, those Irish Catholics being persecuted by the British Protestants. Now, he began to draw their ire. There you go, right? Oh. And, and, and of, of the British government. So on, on August 30th of 1849, Corcoran is going to leave Ireland for New York City to avoid being imprisoned. Yeah, he the, so, he it was found out that he was part of this group and the Irish police were like, no, no more. And I mean, these guys, these these ribbon men were, they were going around burning barns and crops in the field. They crippled the cattle and they destroyed farm equipment. It was just, think a lot of what 
kind of the stories you hear about Sherman on the March yeah. to the Sea. These are like what the bummers, like that's what they yeah, were. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, group. New York City prison. I don't know, mm-hmm. I guess, but they took, they chose New York City, right? And, and so basically, um, he's going to arrive in New York uh, in, in October of 1849, and he's going to find work as a clerk. But what he wanted to do was join the United States military because what mm-hmm. he wanted, and this is going to be a common theme throughout this, he wanted to learn how to be a soldier and an officer. So someday he could take that knowledge and return to Ireland to help his country be freed from British rule. So to that end, he's going to join the Irish Fenian Brotherhood, Mary, some group you know pretty well. This is 1848. And he's going to start to recruit Irish to be armed and trained for this ultimate goal of Irish independence, right? Mm -hmm. So 1854, jump a couple years ahead now. Corcoran is going to join that state militia group that I mentioned And he's going to enlist in the 69th New York. By 1858, he was already their colonel. Now, Corcoran, he was a hot-headed fellow, Mary. He hated England so much, he made Sam Adams blush. That's how how bad this guy was. He hated the monarchy. He hated Big Ben. He hated the Spice Girls. He hated (laughs) all of it, everything. So by 1860, he he ends up being court-martialed and removed from command of the 69th for what? for refusing to march in a parade with the 69th militia honoring the the Prince of Wales, Edward VII. I don't want to do it. I ain't doing it. You can't make me do it. Yeah, he just thought, like, he sent a letter to his superiors, which, good on him, saying, like, I can't in good conscience do this with my men. Um, I'm Irish. No way. Or, you know, this is the guy that has been involved in in starving the Irish. Um, And he also considered him to be a tyrant. So, nope. Was going to do it, and and this is all going on. It, it's really when when the rebels, uh, the Confederates fired on Fort Sumter in April of eighteen sixty one, that really got Corcoran off the hook because his charges were dropped and he was restored mm-hmm. to command of the 69th New York because you know because due to his popularity with the Irish in in New York City and his his success in recruiting Irish to fight for the Union Army, he's like, well. We're going to put you back in command. That yeah. Edward Seven thing, he'll deal with it. You know, we're going to move forward with it. And, you know, it's funny. When the war started, you know, some Irish really respected the Southern position. Now, think about it. The, mm-hmm. the South's fighting for their independence, rebellion. It, it, it kind of goes right part and parcel to what it is. So many really saw, but a lot of them saw the war like Corcoran did. Yeah. is really a chance to earn that real-time valuable experience to take home and fight for their, you know, fight their own war someday. So for people like Corcoran, the American Civil War was really a training exercise. It wasn't a war to preserve the Union or any of that stuff um, because the Union hated his people. Mm-hmm. That's So you can just imagine the dilemma these people had, right? Now, Corcoran 69 is going to be called up to federal service almost immediately you know, after something gets fired, he's told to report to Washington in April of 1861. So immediately, what does Corcoran do? He's going to start to recruit Irish, you know, to go ahead and start filling his ranks. Yeah. Now, little did he know, Mary, that one of his best recruiters would be a guy with a similar background who also saw the war as an opportunity to eventually fight for Irish independence, mm-hmm. an immigrant named Thomas Francis Marr. Now, Thomas Marr was born in Waterford, Ireland, but he was hardly made of crystal there. Anyway, <laughs> never mind. Okay. <laughs> so in, in 1848, he's part of the Young uh, Irelanders National mm-hmm. Group, participated in the 1848 rebellion. He was captured and in, in convicted of sedition. Now, although he was initially sent to death, uh, sentenced to death, his sentence was reduced to life in prison in Australia. Now, we're not going to get into Mars history in Ireland. It, it, it's, it's a great history. If, if you're it's very interesting. In, if you're interested in Irish history, study Thomas Marr, his days in Ireland. But that's a whole other deal for a whole different podcast yeah. that focuses on that. But basically, suffice it to say, in 1852, Marr is going to escape from prison. He's going to leave prison and make his way to New York City. And he's going to become a journalist of all things yep. while maintaining his efforts you know, for the Irish cause back home. Mm-hmm. He's given a hero's so, welcome when he arrives he is. too. And he, he goes is. on like this lecture tour and he becomes one of the most famous um, Irishmen in America. He is. When the war begins, Marr, he's going to seize the opportunity to join Corcoran's 69th New York and immediately begin to recruit. Marr is going to put an advertisement in the New York Tribune 
he, he mentioned the thing where he was mm-hmm. a journalist. He writes, 100 young Irishmen, healthy, intelligent, and active, wanted at once to form a company under the command of Thomas Francis Marr. So his recruiting drive was successful, and he ends up being the captain of the new company K in the 69th New York. Now, you mentioned before how he was a speaker. Ironically, a lot of where the places Marr spoke was in the South. Yeah. That's, he- that's where he spoke. The importance of rebellion in, 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 to the Southern audience. And we're all like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. He's, yeah. But ultimately, their support for the institution of slavery ultimately led him to support the Union. Yeah. And he was quite fond of the South, you know, in, in the same way that I think General William Tecumseh Sherman was. But at the end of the day, they were like, we are fighting for the Union. Um, you know, and it's interesting too that one of the um, people that was influential in helping recruit men to this brigade was a um, was the arch. I think he was yeah he's a priest. Um, his name was John Hughes, and he was a priest in uh, New York. And he would basically say you have to join the cause. And he's apparently one of the other other people that is influential in getting people to join in on this. He was, and, and you can miss the obvious Breakfast Club tie-in. Yeah, John we'll Hughes. Let, I know we'll I thought that, that one was. <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the thing about it though is you know. Um, Corcoran again in Mar, there there's a quote here that that Mar says he says it is not our duty to America but to Ireland. Mm-hmm. So so what, what you know they, they basically he, he goes on he goes we cannot hope to succeed in our effort to make Ireland a republic without the moral and material support of the liberty loving citizens of the United States, which is hilarious because that's a tongue in cheek comment because he knows how they've been treated, but he knows. That there's an opportunity here. Yeah. We can go ahead and we can learn from these people, fight from these people, and we can, we can go back. So what's Corcoran going to do? He's going to gather his men in New York, and they're going to be a huge parade, and they're going to feel the cheers of New Yorkers cheering down. Yeah. And you got to imagine that must have been strange because this is not that this is a complete 180 of the experience they've felt in the city. Now they're being cheered because they're fighting fighting for the Union. They're going to arrive in Washington D.C. and they're going to be trained at Fort Corcoran. Okay, yep. and it's in Arlington, Virginia, one of 68 forts protecting what the capital during the Civil War. Ironically, the site of Fort Corcoran is just south of the modern day Lee Highway, whatever. Interesting, it's, it's just north of the Arlington National Cemetery, whatever, it doesn't matter. But but Corcoran is going to use this time to really drill his men in of the 69th really, really hard, as well as build fortifications. Now, these dudes worked and they were told to build fortifications that it was going to take 3,000 men in three weeks to build. Mm-hmm. The 69th built it with 1,200 men in one week. Wow. That's how hard these dudes worked, right? So this is all going on. Across the Potomac at the White House, Abraham Lincoln Mary, the guy with the hat. the hat we talked, the guy with the hat. Now he's sitting there and he's getting a nervous and he's getting impatient because what's going on while these troops are training and building forts he knows the clock is ticking why because these men signed three month papers that's yeah. it so the is the thing about it is, you know including corcoran's guys they're new dare i say corcoran's men are green right yeah. Ooh. Oh god <laughs> anyway but 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 they're but they're not ready to fight yet but and so in it goes we talk about this whole thing with 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 McDowell and McClellan and the, they're slow. Yeah. These guys need to be trained. And mm-hmm. these guys are they're right literally off the boat. They're coming out of clerk's offices. They were coming out of farms. That's who these people were. And and these guys, I mean, again, there's that famous story where one of the Irish brigade guys walks into a magazine of black powder with his pipe lit and they got to stop him from blowing up the oh whole floor. But this this is who these people were. They just they just it, I mean they just don't know. But mm-hmm. nonetheless Lincoln's not going to want want to wait much longer. So they all went, including the 69th New York, down to a railroad junction in Manassas, Virginia, where they will face the, they will see the elephant for the first time on July 21st, 1861, what will be known as the Battle of First Manassas, Bull Run, if you're nasty, right? That's what it's going to be called. Now, Corcoran 69th is going to find itself as part of Daniel Tyler's first division, in the third brigade under their commander, a redheaded Ohioan named William T. Sherman. Yeah. Perhaps you've heard of him. Now, Sherman, always the inclusive fella, no question, <laughs> shockingly, inclusive. shockingly hated the Irish brigade, yep. the, the Irish men. And conversely, they hated him too. 
they just did not get along. You know, it just, it was. So basically it'll be the afternoon of July 21st, what will be known as the first battle of Manassas in the 69th, New York, the fighting Irish will see action. Now on their green regimental flag under a sunburst, an Irish harp was written in Gaelic. It says, Riam nar druid o sparn ayan, which is Gaelic in translate to Mary, you've had enough too much to drink. That's what exactly what it says. <laughs> no, I no it translates no, to it, who never retreated from the clash of spears. Okay, go with that. Commit yourself for that. That's fine. <laughs> but you're right. Now, Corcoran 69th, they're going to pass over the stone bridge and then go to advance to Henry Hill House, where they're going to initially run into troops from Louisiana. And initially, they will be on the left of the brigade of guess who? Oh, who is that? Oliver Otis Howard. It's Howard. There's, There's your Howard, your Howard reference. reference. There you go, right? Now, the thing about the 69th New York is they wore gray uniforms at the time. Mm -hmm. And and so, which allowed them to get, kind of get right up to the Confederate lines. Yeah. I mean, the uniforms were, were all messed up. The at the time, like they had gray. no, like, they had no uniformity in the uniforms. There's oh, my joke for this episode. Okay. Wow. Thanks for coming. Oh, God, I didn't realize I was dealing with Don Rickles today, but in any case. <laughs> but the uniforms was a deal where everything was going back and forth. Um, when they got to Henry Hill House, because of the heat the men removed their jackets and then charged a correspondent from the harper's weekly he wrote about this in 69th he wrote the irish stripped themselves and rushed into the enemy with utmost fury the difficulty was keeping them quiet so that's you can imagine right yeah now they eventually are going to fall back they're going to take 192 casualties including 40 men killed one of the survivors uh said of this irish regiment charge of the 69th it was training school to open men's eyes to the real necessities of war. Now, among the casualties was their colonel, Michael Corcoran, yeah. who was captured along with 30 or so of the, of the Irish 69th, and he's going to get shipped off to Liberty, uh, Libby President in Richmond, Virginia. Now, now it's funny, you know, Corcoran's eventually is going to get released from Libby, yeah. and he's going to he's going to return to the army. But his days with his hand-picked Irishmen in the Irish Brigade that will later be called are over. April of 1863, Corcoran finds himself trying to pass through a picket line in the, of the 9th New York in Richmond. And when stopped by a sentry, not sure if the sentry said, howdy, friend, where are you headed? <laughs> but they, but he, was, he was stopped. When Corcoran didn't have the necessary password to pass through, he got pissed off. And what does he do? He's going to shoot and kill the commander of the 9th New York, Edgar Addison Kimball. And for oh some God. reason, who knows why, Corker was never arrested or punished, and it's likely because th th there's some stories that Kimball was drunk, was mouthing off anti-Irish stuff, and Corcoran got pissed and killed him. But but whatever it was, I, Corcoran is going to go his own direction. He's going to end up recruiting for a separate Irish group mm -hmm. called the Corcoran Legion. It eventually got command of a division in, in the, uh, the 22nd Corps under General Samuel Heinzelman. Uh, in Washington, and he was ordered to help defend those forts. We talked a little yeah. about Heinzelman and stuff like that. But anyway, one day late in December of 1863, Corcoran's riding on his horse in Fairfax, Virginia. He's going to get thrown off his horse. He's going to fracture his skull. Ugh. He's going he's gonna to die on December 22nd of 1863 at the WP Gunnel House in Fairfax. Ironically, we visited Mosby. it. It's the same house that John Mosby caught, um, yep. caught Stoughton in. Spanked uh, and he sir he certainly did. It was always it's kind of strange because you know a, a strange and ignominious death for such an Irish soldier with such a pedigree. Yeah. And we'll see later on he's not going to be the only Irish leader of this brigade who's going to kind of die a weird and lonely death. We'll get yeah. to him later. Okay. But anyways, with their uh, with their new colonel now uh, with Colonel I'm sorry with Colonel Michael Corkin being captured um, in the three months papers expiring, most of the survivors of the 69th New York. What do they do? They quit. Yeah. And if they don't sign up, they, I probably wouldn't do anymore. after Bull Run. I mean, that was right. kind of a shit show. It was. So there's going to be a new commander, Thomas Marr, yeah. the former captain of, of Company K. He's going to be promoted up. Now, with few men remaining, Marr is going to have to do a total rebuild from scratch. And, and really, um, this time when he's signing his men, he's smart. You know what he does? He signs three, three year papers. Yeah. He ain't stupid, right? Now, once the 69th New York was filled again, he eventually filled four additional regiments to form what will be forever known as the Irish Brigade. So along with the 69th New York, he added the 63rd New York from Staten Island, New York, 
the 88th New York from the Bronx, as well as the 116 PA from Philadelphia, which is going to come later on. They're going to come later, mm-hmm. but that's who it's going to be. Another regiment, the, it's the 29th Massachusetts. These, this is non-Irish. I don't know how the heck. This they, is so I, funny. It was a mistake. They were supposed to get the 28th. With, right. But the 29th is from Plymouth County. And so they're descended from pilgrims and stuff. And you can't even like, you know, they have been in their families have been here for like how many years? And they're fighting with these Irish guys, a lot of them immigrants, right? It just was well, like le- leave it to the right, leave it to the United States Army to find the only non-Irish guys in Boston. Yeah. But that's the case. But anyway, it's called the you know, like it's the Pilgrim Regiment. That's yeah. exactly who, who they are from our, our neck of the woods right here. Okay. Um, so this so this brigade for the most part, um, it's it's full of Irish and they were very cohesive. It sounded like it was sound like it was gonna be really, really good, but there are problems. There are political problems that are coming out of Washington and that anti-Irish nativist sentiment we talk about. It's going to resurface again. Hmm. The problem, the problem in Washington wasn't an all Irish brigade. The problem with the powers that be was they weren't too comfortable having an Irish man, formerly an agitator from the old country like Mar, to lead it. Yeah, what they wanted was an American to lead it. So instead of Mar, they compromised. They found a guy who was born in Ireland but came here a lot earlier, named James Shields. Mm-hmm. So James Shields is going to be the initial commander of the Irish Brigade. Now, Shields is born in Elmore, Ireland, but he came to the U.S. in 1826. So he didn't experience the potato famine. He didn't experience a lot of that unrest that existed in Ireland in the 1840s and 1850s. James Shields was living in Springfield, Illinois in 1842 when someone named Aunt Becca began publishing negative letters yeah. about Shields in the newspaper. Now, Shields was pissed off. He publicly challenged Aunt Becca to a duel which never happened, which is probably good in the overall picture because who's Aunt Becca? Aunt Becca is Abraham Lincoln. It's and Abraham quite Lincoln. possibly Mary Lincoln helping him out too. So it's just kind of funny how these whole things kind of, uh, these all kind of go together. But as you can imagine, these Irish troops didn't take too well to losing Mar as their brigade commander mm-hmm. for a guy who they didn't consider Irish. Think of losing Franz Siegel and bringing in Howard with the 11. It's oh, the same it, sentiment, kind of. It, it's like, I mean, it's a clash of cultures. I mean, Mar is going to understand those guys better than what Shields is, right? <laughs> Even though Shields is born in Ireland, he's basically coming over here as, you know, he's really young when he does. So he doesn't experience the famine yeah. like Mar has and all that. But, you know, what Shields is, though, is he's smart, okay? And what he does is something that's very it's very very ultimately self-serving but brilliant you know what he's going to do he's going to call a meeting with mar and then he's going to write a letter to washington and i'm going to read a portion of the letter he's going to write i'm not going to say an irish accent i'm just going to read <laughs> thank you okay then you're welcome i wish to say a few words relative to myself and the brigade i was in the western states of mexico endeavoring to recruit my shattered health when i received the intelligence of my appointment as to the general of the Irish Brigade. On my arrival in New York, I was sorry to find there was a misunderstanding relative to General Marr and myself. I know General Marr very well. You did right in selecting him to command your brigade. He is better qualified for that position than three quarters of the men who have been appointed to similar commands. I hope to have the Irish Brigade with its gallant brigadier, Thomas Marr, at some future day in my division of the army. So what does he do? That letter promotes himself to division. Yeah. Right? So now he's going to be the division commander. So Mar is going to run the Irish brigade, but still under Shields' tutelage. And guess what? It freaking works. Yeah. Washington, he gets, he writes a letter, gets promoted, and they go, well, he's still commanding the Irish, but not what we wanted. This looks a pretty good deal. Honestly, it's where he probably gets promoted because of Abraham Lincoln and that connection. And like Abraham Lincoln never liked to talk about that duel. Some guy brought it up and Lincoln was like, if you value your life, you will never bring this up again in my presence. Absolutely. I mean, he's so embarrassed by it. The super sports agent, Scott Boris, could not have pulled off a better deal. I mean, this he, he, he really did it. He really did himself some well. So now the Irish Brigade, under his direct control, Thomas Marr, begins the heavy task of recruiting. Now, He's tasked to recruit 2,000 men to keep the Irish Brigade intact. So after his first attempt, guess how many men he's able to sign out of 2,000? Like 
2000. 250. <laughs> That's it. Only 250. July 20, July 25th, 1862. Mar is going to be in New York City speaking to a large Irish crowd like he's a football coach pushing Irish pride and Irish manhood with the ranks. You've got to join for the old country. But what he didn't know was that the previous members of the 69th who hadn't signed up again when their three-month papers expired were working against him, and he didn't know it. See, those former members came home and told everybody how miserable their experience was, and whatever you do, unless you're an officer, yep. do not join the army. Don't do it. One former Irish soldier he'd, he'd, from the 69th, the original, mm -hmm. he described life with the Union Army. He wrote, the Union Army as a perfect hell of vulgarity, profanity, in tyranny. To me, it sounds like an afternoon in the bleachers at Yankee Stadium, yeah. but that's how he experienced his experience with the 69th. But profanity, that is funny. Like, them yeah. saying, like you got to wonder, what was he hearing? I mean, not but, to be stereotypical, but, they, but... Well, a lot, a lot of these guys, a lot of these guys are Irish Catholics, though. Oh, that's they, true. I mean, yeah. But so they, they don't want... But they're saying, listen, I don't care what this dude says. I don't care where he's from. I don't care what his goal is. Just... These aren't the droids you're looking for. Yeah. Just don't do it. Stay away, right? So for the most part, a few months later in September of 1862, Robert E. Lee's army of, of Northern Virginia, they're going to find themselves marching into Maryland. Mm -hmm. And both armies will famously clash in Sharpsburg on the 17th of September at the Battle of Antietam, right? Yeah. Now, commanding this Union army at this point was General George McClellan, who, who the Irish Brigade absolutely loved. They mm -hmm. loved Little Mac. They did. Because he was cautious. He didn't take their lives. They he didn't treat them like dogs like they were used to yeah. being treated. They would they would and so so he he valued human life more than soldier life in, in yeah. their minds, right? So, you know, whatever so despite whatever caution that, that McClellan displayed, it was here at the Battle of Antietam that the Irish Brigade really got their names in the annals of Civil War combat. Mm -hmm. The Irish Brigade is going, to be, is going to be the second brigade in Israel Richardson's first division of Edwin Sumner's second corps. Now, their task will be to attack and hold a small sunken road in the middle of the battlefield, which will later, of course, be known as Bloody Lane. And you know, a lot of people know about the story, but it's interesting how it leads up to this. Now, Marr has his 88th uh, New York under Patrick Kelly. The 69th is now under James Kelly. The 63rd is now commanded by John Burke and that non-Irish 29th Massachusetts, the Puritan Regiment, yeah. is under Joseph Burns. At about 9.30 in the morning, the Irish Brigade is going to cross in Tetum Creek in a place called Prize Ford. Now, they formed at the edge of a cornfield where their chaplain, Boston College fan William Corby, Mary, sure he is. Is, is riding along on <laughs> no horseback. <term> <laughs> anyway, anyway, he's riding along on horseback, giving the men their absolution, you know, before battle. He, mm -hmm. he'll, do this, he'll do this a lot, but this is when he does it in Antietam. Now, the 69th New York is going to form on the right, followed by the 29th Mass, those non-Irish guys, then the 63rd, and then the 88th as they begin to cross a cornfield. Now, it should be noted the Irish Brigade did not carry rifled muskets. They didn't. They carried 69 caliber smoothbore buck and ball rifles, which are far less accurate than the rifle musket, and which require and it required men for the most part to fight in much closer yeah. distance to be effective. The, the, the smoothbores are effective at 25 yards, but beyond that, there's no guarantee. At 100 yards, they aren't really accurate at all. So that put them at a great disadvantage when the Confederates who had Enfields and Springfields for the most part, uh, were firing upon them at yeah. a much further range, right? In their front of the sunken row were regiments from George B. Anderson's uh, division, uh, brigade in D.H. Hill's division. We're talking the 2nd, the 4th, the 14th, and the 30th North Carolina. Now, Marr will be leading the Irish brigade forward, riding his horse, and once they reach the crest of the, of the, of the ridge, they're going to be stopped flat by the rebel fire. Mm -hmm. Burke, 63rd New York, is going to be hit hard once the fire begins. They're going to be pounded. Mars horse will be shot and killed, throwing him from it. The 88th New York, they're the ones under Patrick Kelly. They're going to advance towards the sunken road and get about 500 yards from it. But again, they weren't ordered. They weren't ordered to fire because no. why? The smooth bores won't reach. Yeah. So they're, so they're just standing around, staring at each mm -hmm. other. They're just going to stare. Right. 
and he's going to stay there. A soldier in the 88th New York, he said of this assault, the shot and shell of the enemy poured over our heads and crashed into the hollow of the rear. The bullets were whirring a boot, but we had not <laughs> commenced to fire yet. Before long, what happens? The color bearers start to be dropped one after yeah. the other. Captain Patrick Clooney from Company E of the 88th, a native of Waterford, again, not Crystal. <laughs> he's only 20, he's just 22 years old. He's going to pick up the fallen regimental flag. He's going to be shot through the knee, but he's somehow able to still get up and he's going to waddle his way to within 30 feet of the sunken road before being killed instantly oh. and shot in the head in the shot in, in the head and chest at the same time. Now, no one knows who Patrick Clooney is, but Patrick Clooney, he's buried in Calvary Cemetery in Queens, New York. And this is this this cemetery, if you're ever in Queens, is where a lot of the Irish Brigade guys are buried. This includes Michael Corcoran when he dies, as well as John uh, Buford's Cavalry commander, Thomas Devon, mm -hmm. the Cavalry guy. Not sure if his burial spot is the best damn ground he's ever seen. Probably is. But, that, <laughs> but, but that's where he's buried. Oh, by the way, fun fact, you know who else is buried in the cemetery? Singer Tony Bennett and really? the great act, the great actor from Blazing Saddles, Dom DeLuise. Interesting. So if you go, if you go to the cemetery, you can go visit them all. But that's, that's where they're cool. all buried. But despite this valiant effort, the Irish Brigade, they, they're going to struggle to break the line of the sunken road. But they put up a hell of a fight. They're yeah. fighters. That's who they are. One of the North Carolinians fighting them of the Irish Brigade. He's going to say, "The Irish stood in line on the ridge of, in plain view with three colors, three flags as colors." One of the stars and stripes, one a state flag, and one green flag with the harp of Aaron. Our men kept the flags falling fast, but just as fast they were raised up again, still defiant. In Tiedem to this day it remains the bloodiest day in American history, and the Irish Brigade significantly added to this butcher's bill. Yeah. Just, just looking at these casualties, the 69th New York ended the day with just 100 men left. They lost 61% casualties. The 63rd New York lost 60% of their men, 6-0. Combined, those two regiments lost 600 men alone. The 88th got off easy, only losing 38% of their men. So this was in this was Antietam, right? Yeah. And anybody who studies Antietam knows. But it absolutely ripped the Irish Brigade to shreds, including those battle flags we talked about. They yeah. were so shot up and ripped apart that they were sent back to New York City for repair. They lost their flags. Wow. And they weren't captured. They were shot to hell. Yeah. Following the Battle of Antietam, the Irish Brigade Mary is going to literally get insults added to their injury, literally and figuratively, with a double dose of FU. The first one is on September 22nd, 1862, less than a week after the battle. Abraham Lincoln is going to release his preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, yeah. which does what? That's going to free the slaves that are... It's going to free the slaves South. in rebel territory. Yep. For the Irish, this was their worst nightmare. Like we said earlier, this was what they did not want. Yep. You know, with the with the war's goals being shifted, really, for ending slavery, it meant that when it was all over, they're going to have to compete with free slaves for those low-paying jobs back home, assuming they won. The second bit of bad news that they got was they learned their beloved commander, George McClellan, got the heave ho, just like the Buffalo Bills in the playoffs every single year. <laughs> and reportedly, many of the men of the Irish Brigade, they openly wept when they heard this news. Yeah. So just, just imagine, you fight, you're losing 60%, 61%, 38%, you're losing all your flags, right? Now, Emancipation Proclamation is coming down. You lose McClellan. And guess what? You're not even fighting for your own freaking country. No. But you know what, though? Energizer Bunny, they kept going. Yeah, they, they just they, they keep did. going for whatever reason. They keep going. Um, you know, and they they're gonna like the next battle they're gonna be involved in is Fredericksburg in December of eighteen sixty two. It, it is, and there's, this... there's gonna be a there's gonna be a big change though. There's gonna be a big reformation. Yeah. In 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 this whole thing, Irish Brigade still men of Thomas Marr, but now they have, they have a new overall commander, the Second Corps. Guess who? Hancock. Winfield no. Scott Hancock. Scott Hancock. That's right. Yeah. Oh my God. The, the, can, the candy man himself. He's going to be taking over the. He's going to be take, taking over the second corps. Right now, this is when you mentioned before the, the mistake in the in the, the regiments. Yeah. The twenty eighth Mass, the Puritan regiment. Um, they're going to get replaced with the with the twenty eighth Massachusetts under Richard Burns from he's from County Cavan Ireland. 
Um, this is a, he, this is the guy who briefly served under Benjamin Butler in the Carolinas. Yeah. But the 28th Massachusetts was the prototypical Irish. I mean, that's who these people were, right? They had Dunkin' Donuts flowing out of their friggin' veins. That's the how that's how far they were, right? The 28th <laughs> Mass, they carried that unique green Tiffany flag with their and their regimental motto was of course Fa Abala, yeah. which means clear the road. And it would become one of the more famous battle cries in the entire Union Army. If you go to the monuments today, Gettysburg, you still see Fa yeah. Abala. This is specific to the 28th Massachusetts. They also added the 116th, we kind of hinted them earlier, from Philadelphia under the command of Colonel Dennis Heenan. Um, now, these guys were green as well. They arrived near Fredericksburg directly from their training camp in Washington after just a few weeks of skirmishing in the Shenandoah, in, and they, so they didn't see much. So there are also some regimental changes in the old Irish Brigade. Colonel Robert Nugent is now in charge of the 69th, who replaced the injured Daniel Kelly, who got who got wounded at Antietam. Now, the one thing they could not replace were those green regimental flags mm. that were shipped back to New York City for repair that got shot apart. So you know so you know what they did instead of the flags? Didn't they so I don't know. I, I don't know. Okay, well, that's a great <laughs> answer, but that's yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so in lieu in lieu of flags, the men, what they did is they put green sprigs of, mm. of boxwood oh, uh, right. trees yep. into their caps. So to know each other as the Irish Brigade, but also as a way to follow each other into battle. When you see the pictures from Fredericksburg, you see the, yeah. the, the, the sprigs. That's what they are. Now, this will be the situation when the new commander Ambrose Burnside's army will begin the Battle of Fredericksburg on Saturday, December 13, 1862. The Irish Brigade will once again put up, basically put up front, which they tend to do. Yeah. And they are going to fight brutally. Yep. Mary's and, Heights. One guy said they're going to lead us over in front of those guns, which we have seen placing unhindered for the past three weeks. Yeah. I mean, it's the Irish, you know, for the most part, they're going to be part of Edward Summers left wing now. Yeah. And they're going to cross the Rappahannock and they're going to proceed through those open fields towards the Heights, which is, which is uh, outside of town targeting the area on the mansion built by John Murray. It's done today as Brompton mansion. But positioned on Murray's Heights were rebel artillery and infantry behind a stone wall and a sunken road. I mean, it's just a brutal, brutal place. Yeah. The 116th Pennsylvania, they're going to be seeing this. They're going to see be battle for the first time here. Their lieutenant colonel, a guy named St. Clair Augustine, he's from Lisbon, Ireland, and future Philadelphia police chief, Mary, of all things. He's one <laughs> wow. of late after the war. He's going to write this about the regimental's the regiment's baptism of fire. He's going to write, the hills rained with fire and the men advanced with heads bowed, walking towards a hailstorm. Still through the deadly shower, the ever thinning lines pressed on. The plain over which they passed was covered with men of the second corps dead in twos and threes. The men of the Irish brigade, they pressed up that slope towards that stone wall, right? Mm -hmm. Now, and this is one of the more fascinating stories of the Civil War, in my opinion. Behind the stone wall is a brigade of, of Georgians uh, under Thomas R. R. Cobb. He's a, a lawyer. He's a fire-eating, fun lover. He's everything. He's, he play, he's, he's the Confederate. He plays yeah. the part. 16th, 18th, 24th Georgia, okay? Within his brigade, it, it, it ended up creating a true brother-on-brother -brother situation. Yeah. The 24th Georgia was made up of guess who? Irish. Of Irish, yeah. now the, it's funny. The men of the, it's funny how how history is. The men of the twenty fourth, similar story as the others. They escaped Ireland to travel to the United States, but by happenstance, by fate, they emigrated to Savannah, Georgia, mm -hmm. instead of New York City. So when the war started, they fought for the Confederacy. Yeah, it's just because that's where the boat took them. That that's yeah. where they fought. It makes. I mean, it makes sense. Like, no, of course it does. Yeah, but but um, the colonel was a guy named Robert McMillan. And likewise, you know, he fought, you know, he, they fought under a green flag with the harp and the, the whole deal. So it's a cruel irony that on this day, when the Union made that fifth fatal charge at Maurice Heights, that it was when Mars men advanced, both sides knew they were fighting, fighting Irish brothers. Yeah. One of the Irish Confederates in the 24th, Georgia, he says, he, on speak, he's, he's seeing Mars guys coming up with yeah. a spray in their hat. And he says, oh, what a pity. Here comes Mars fellows. So yeah. they knew who they were They were fighting. Thomas Marr, he's going to be injured here. He's going to be shot in the knee. 
He's going to climb up his white horse before a shell fragment is going to knock him out of the saddle. And as he's being carried to the rear, he's yelling, load and fire at will. He's got his dander up. His face is yeah. red. He's going, you can only imagine. So as a battle rages up on that slope, many of the Union Irish, you know, they're lying on their stomachs just to find shelter. The bullets are wh- whizzing by. Some are hiding behind a stone shed. When the battle stalled, Major James Cavanaugh, Ka- the 69th New York, he's, he's, he's rallying his men. He's, he's yelling, blaze away, stand it, boys. And the men are now 50 feet away from the stone wall. Mm-hmm. If you've been to Fredericksburg, I know there's housing developments and people are all mad, but, but if you go there and you see, you're standing at that wall, you have 50, you probably have 100 feet of grass in front of you. Mm-hmm. That's where the Irish Brigade got. You can, it, it's, you can still see it. Captain John O'Neill, he took a bullet in the chest in a lodge in his spine. Okay, the color bearer, Sergeant William Tyrell, was hit by an exploding shell, but managed to get himself up on one knee before he was hit with five mini balls at once in the chest. Oh. Boom, 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 boom. The battle, the battle along the Stonewall of Fredericksburg was some of the most vicious and some of the most personal in the entire American Civil mm-hmm. War. After the battle, even the Confederates, they were in awe of what yeah. they saw with, with these Union guys. None other than Confederate General George Pickett Mary, of all people, he writes to his fiance Sally about the charge of the Irish Brigade. He Pickett's going to write, "Your soldier, you know, meaning him, your soldier's heart almost stood still as he watched those sons of Aaron fearlessly rush up to their deaths. Their brilliant assault on Maurice Heights of the Irish Brigade was beyond description. We forgot they were fighting us, and cheer after cheer went up." To go there because of their fearlessness went up about the lines. So they were fighting so hard the Rebs were cheering them. Yeah. That's how guys were going. A rebel artillerist, Washington artillery from Louisiana, he writes, the gallantry of the enemy pushed on beyond all charges and fought as they left their dead 20 paces from the sunken road. Even on the Union side, old Winnie Boy, Winsfield Scott Hancock, mm. he says to Marr after the assault on Maurice Heights, General Marr, I have never seen anything so splendid. Yeah. Okay. Well. And yet, well, the way the Irish were writing about it, though, they write like the the men who fought in the Irish Brigade. They write you can get a like you definitely get a sense of just how horrific and bloody this battle was. Um, one soldier from the 88th New York um, wrote, "The Battle of Fredericksburg should be written in letters of blood on the banners of the Irish Brigade." Um, and mm-hmm. another uh, Captain William J. Nagel of the 88th New York said. Irish blood and Irish bones cover that terrible field today. We are slaughtered like sheep and no result but defeat. Um, And then another one said, as for the remnant of the brigade, they were the most dejected set of Irishmen you ever saw or heard of. And this is after the battle, how they were feeling. The quotes go go on up. Father Corby, he he writes about this afterwards. The place where Mars Brigade was sent was truly a slaughter pen. Now, when you look at the numbers, and there's some more quotes we'll talk about, but the, the Battle of Fredericksburg ends. The Irish Brigade will have seen 14 of their 15 officers cut down, yeah. as well as 512 of their 1,000 men. That's gigantic. They earn the respect from both sides for fighting through this pure hell right up to that stone wall before falling back. When Mars men when they finally said enough was enough and they started to fall back, the Irish on the 24th Georgia, you know what they did? They stood and cheered them. Yeah. Despite losing 100 men of their own to these men, when they started falling back and they were clearly retreating, they got a standing ovation from the Confederate Irish for their effort. And that's just amazing. And that, that, those, yeah. those stories are incredible. You know, a pr- private Welsh, uh, Peter Welsh of the 28th Mass, he writes to his wife after the battle. He, he writes, thank God I came out safe. Our brigade got terribly cut up. It is so small now that it is unfit into any further action unless it is recruited up. Yep. I mean, it, it's 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 fat. And people who've been to Fredericksburg and you study the battle, and it, it's and everyone knows the carnage of it. It's tougher to get an idea of what happened there just because of like the developments and stuff. But you can go there, and if you go there having like you know this kind of in your mind, you know it it is a very very powerful place. And like what you said about that soldier saying we need to have more recruits that is going to factor into the aftermath of Fredericksburg because that is not a good time for the Irish brigade after Fredericksburg. It's not a good time for the army of the Potomac, 
in general, it's one of their, um, all of Rhoda's Howard would say that this time after Fredericksburg is morale is at the lowest it's ever been, you know? I mean, it, no, there's, there's no question. I yeah. mean, I mean, just, it just, and we'll talk about this in a second, but it's kind of hard when, when you're trying to rally an army, um, and you, you're trying your best and, and it just isn't happening. I mean, like you said, despite it all, Mars goal was again, to try to gain experience to take home mm-hmm. for Irish independence, but it's men were on rock bottom. I mean, they were, yeah. and I know you got some stuff to talk about the post thing, but as that calendar flips from 62 into 63, um, it's, it's just, it's a, they fall back into winter quarters of the union army and the Irish brigade are going to have a really, really tough time. Yeah. And so in January of 1863, Mar is going to return to New York for a high mass, um, recognizing the sacrifices that the Irish Brigade have made. Um, and he is going to discover that things are not good on the home front in New York City for the Irish and, the, and their feeling toward the Civil War. And it probably goes back to what you were talking about with these guys from the 69th that only signed, you know, the three month papers that they're they're going back and be like, this was hell. This is not worth it. Don't join up. Um, the Irish in New York. Um, are reading the Irish in New York are also reading the newspapers and you know the ones that come out after Antietam but also now that Mars back there they are reading the ones that are coming out after Fredericksburg as well and the lengthy casualty reports and there it's just kind of you know feeding into what they already know their impression of this is it's not good to join the Union Army and fight um so Mar is also warned that the recruitment of Irish men would only work if men could be found to volunteer, you know, there and um, Colonel James Meehan of the Irish Brigade commented on the lack of account in any New York newspaper about the brigade at Fredericksburg. He said, though we were certain that we had fought well and bravely, yet we wished to have the particulars, every other brigade being particularized. So they're mentioning other brigades in the Army of the Potomac. They're not mentioning the Irish Brigade. And these guys, you know, they fought just as just as hard, like they went through whatever, and they want to be recognized for what happened. Um, and because of all the losses, you know, Mar is kind of like, you know, we need to move this brigade from the field. We need to get more more men in it. We need to like, you know, get our numbers up a bit, just as you said with that one quote from the soldier. Um, and New York's warning to the War Department, like Mar. There was one warning that said to bring them into conflict with the enemy in their present condition is an outrage on the humanity on which the, we trust the government will not be guilty. And this is New York. This is an Irish newspaper's warning to the War Department mm-hmm. saying you need to help us out. Um, Marr pushes Lincoln and Stanton to grant the Irish Brigade special leave to rest and recruit its depleted ranks. At times, he does not hear back from either the War Department or from Lincoln. And at other times, War Department or fi- officials are telling him there's not enough troops to grant their leave for the brigade. Keep in mind, they're in winter quarters at this point, And other brigades in the Army of the Potomac are getting leave. Um, one soldier in the Irish Brigade wrote to his mother and said, We thought surely our brigade was going home to New York, but we were kept back. It would not be let go in account of we being Irish. So they know what's happening. Um, yep. And the, the Irish in New York are becoming very angry at the way the brigade's being treated. Um, an editor of the Irish American said, it appears to me if they were the most anxious to blot out our race altogether, they seem not to recollect the fact that we are that they are doing all in their power to demoralize the remnant of a magnificent brigade. And Boston's um, Irish newspaper, The Pilot, said the Irish spirit for the war is dead, absolutely dead. And this is mm-hmm. what they're dealing with after Fredericksburg. This, and you know, it's a combination of what you mentioned with the men with the three month papers going back from the 69th to New York and talking about it's not a good situation, but it's also the casualty lists, how high they are, especially after yeah. Fredericksburg. And just so, that the so, Irish are being neglected. And he has a tough time recruiting, but he's also got a morale problem within his troops. And he yeah. he does he does something that is is fascinating in, in this winter quarters. You know, it's 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 approaching March of of 1863. And what holiday is in March? St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day. So what he decides what he wants to do is he's gonna he has an idea to motivate his men to hopefully get them back in a fighting spirit. Whatever guys, we got to do what we got to do. So, you know, he decides to hold a huge St. Patrick's Day celebration for his men. 
This celebration included a bunch of contests with prizes given away. It was kind of like a big fair. He, um, they, they had they had all these games. Um, so there was they inc- games included races. They had dance offs. They had a dunk the rosewoods clown booth. I mean, they had everything. They, 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 they had a they had a game where you could you could try to catch an oil pig for prizes. Oh, I and, remember reading right, about this right. in um, in one of the um, books about the Army of the Potomac. Yeah, and so they it was a big party, and naturally, Mar made sure these men had plenty of alcohol. He yep. loaded them up. Mar made a drink for them that he called whiskey punch. Okay, I happened to get the recipe for this one, Mary. Oh, well, we need to make this, this sometime. He had a huge barrel made with 10 gallons of rum, eight bottles of champagne, and 22 gallons of whiskey in this big jug. Oh. Sounds like a Friday night Goddard. But here, so he, <laughs> you so, got to so, put some juice in there to like I mean, get the alcohol. Oh yeah. I mean, needless to say, Mars St. Patty's Day celebration turned into a full call me maybe situation. I mean, it, it just, and that was the whole point of it. The highlight of the day was a huge horse steep a steeplechase race over 20,000 union soldiers came out to watch it it was advertised in the, in the camp and it said to come off the 17th of march rain or shine by horses the property of and to be ridden by the commissioned officers of the irish brigade the prizes are a purse of $500 this is the steeplechase two and a half a two and a half mile heat best two out of three over four hurdles of four and a half feet high with five feet ditches, including two artificial rivers, 15 feet wide and six feet deep. It was a big contest. The judge of the race, the judge who decided the winner was guess who? Oh, what? it was the, it was Joe Hooker was the judge. <laughs> he had to decide who won. Thomas Marr himself handed out the prizes. So you can imagine, you can imagine just what a hit this was. Um, Samuel Partridge of the 13th New York, he was watching. He said of the event, it was the biggest spree I ever went to. And you can only imagine um, just the hilarity this thing must have been. And with all these pro- and it, it worked because he brought them around his men up. He let the mm-hmm. Irish guys have fun, got them drunk. Gave them money, had prizes. They, they had all these food brought in, chickens and and ham and a DQ gift cards, ho hos. The whole thing they brought in to rise the morale of, of his men, and it was brilliant on it. Well, that it guy makes sense because of what he experienced in New York when he was yeah. back there in January. That he saw like how things were, and he's like, he probably like, I need to raise morale. If you get a chance, and we're not going to talk a lot about it now, go into study this party they had and there's a lot of stuff written about it it is hilarious right. i just kind of touched on it but there's so much more to it but uh but at the end of the day needless to say this must this would have been a blast to be at just yeah. imagine i right? wonder if the 11th core guys came over to it because by then i think they had no that was before they had their beer yeah, cut, yeah definitely. i wonder if the 11th core of the germans <laughs> got involved too oh yeah Peter Welsh, I mentioned before, the, the flag bearer, the, I mean, the guy from the 28th Massachusetts, um, on St. Patty's Day, he got a promotion, again, I gave it away, to be the flag bearer, the color sergeant of his 28th Mass Regiment. And for the first time, you know, he's going to carry that battle flag a few months later in the Battle of Chancellorsville. Now, mm-hmm. now the thing about it is kind of going with this, just imagine this Irish brigade. They can't recruit. They're losing men because they're they're at the front of every battle. They're getting shot back. They're getting killed, captured. So they're losing men. It's like a car rolling down the street, losing parts. That's that's they're losing it. Like in planes, trains, automobiles. Exactly. So you know, Mar is rehabbing his injuries from Fredericksburg. It was, but he was back in time at Chancellorsville, where his men did see limited action. They mainly mm-hmm. fought along the line by the Chancellor House, is kind of where they were. Yeah. But there was no wholesale slaughter for the Irish this time. They kind of were allowed to stay back a little bit. And and just understand the numbers. A year before Chancellorsville, the Irish Brigade stood at 4,000. 4,000 strong, lower dated, fired guys. A year later, it, after the Battle of Chancellorsville, Guess, guess how many men the Irish Brigade had left? Not three hundred. Yeah. So you, that's crazy. He, I mean, basically, he needed more men, and badly, you kind of hinted at it. He wanted to go back to New York City to recruit more. 
again after Chancellorsville. And he made his request to Washington, and they said no. And for, Ma- no. and for Mar, this was the final kick in his shillelagh. That, yeah. that was this. He was done. He decides he's had enough. Look, I tried. This isn't happening. I'm going to give it the old quit. So despite you know, despite what his men had given in blood for a country that wasn't even theirs, it was clear Washington and the Washington nativists were done with this Irish brigade. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he ends up, Marr, resigning. He resigns his commission on May 14th, 1863. He's done. Now, the Irish brigade did not die with Marr's resignation. Although the numbers are going to be a more sh- in the shadow of what they used to be. Yeah. By the time of the Gettysburg campaign, the 63rd, 88th, and 69th New York were down to two companies, while the 116th, the new guys, were down to four companies. You know, Patrick Kelly is now the brigade commander, and he's part of John Caldwell's division in Hancock's 2nd Corps. And we're not going to get into too much Gettysburg with, with, with the Irish Brigade, mm-hmm. but um, – but the thing about it, though, is, is with their remaining troops, they're still going to be with those smooth bores. Yeah, they're going to fight hard at the wheat field on July second. They fired so many rounds on the July second on on uh, George Rose's twenty six acre wheat field. They ran out of ammunition in twenty minutes. Yeah, that's how hard they fought. Okay, now the Fighting Irish still had the Fighting Irish spirit. There's no question they did, despite the fact. That it was clear now this dream of earning this valuable experience and going back to Ireland was basically over. It, it yeah, was. It, it kind of, and you know, also, like at Gettysburg, too, this is where uh, Father Corby is going to give them absolution again. And he's got that statue there. Um, and he realized he had no time to hear each man's confession individually. So he puts on the violet stole, climbed up on a rock, and gave the Irish Brigade their general absolution. Um, Colonel St. Clair Augustine, I think you mentioned before, he writes oh. about it from the 116th PA. Um, but they're there and they um, they lose the majority of their remaining soldiers at Gettysburg. He ends, uh, Augustine, he ends up being like the historian of the 116th PA. Yeah. He, he's, he's an interesting read if you can find his papers. He talks a lot about it. Um, but it was December of 1863, jumping ahead real quick, you know, Thomas Barr's resignation is going to be kind of be rescinded by the U.S. Army. They kind of mm-hmm. take it back. He's going to be sent up to your neck of the woods, the Western Theater, Mary. He'll yeah. command a division of the Army of the Ohio before quitting for good on May 15, 1865. He'll move to Montana, yeah. and he'll become their acting governor. Um, now, back east, though, we'll get to Mar in a second to talk about what happens with him. But back in the east, the Irish Brigade officially came to an end on June of 1864 when the United States Army basically disbanded the rest of the brigade and spread the remaining troops out among the 3rd and 4th Brigades in the 1st Division of the 1st Corps. Yeah. So they're going to get spread out. So what's interesting about this, though, is despite the fact that the Fighting 69th New York, that they were is a Civil War regiment, they still exist today. Yep. After, after the Civil War, they were part of the Rainbow Division that fought in World War I. They participated in the Western the Pacific Theater in World War II as part of the 27th Infantry Division. Mm-hmm. In 1963, the Irish Catholic president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, he's going to present a battle flag of the Irish Brigade to Ireland as a thank you for their support of the Union. Today, the 69th New York, uh, which is it's not called the 69th New York, but, the, but what they are, what they mm-hmm. were, can be found in the 1st Battalion, and they fought as recently as in Afghanistan. That's so it, that's, so, so it, that's really cool. So it goes on. But we talked before about Corker and Strange Death. Right yeah. where he died, he fell off the horse, and Fairfax dies on December twenty second at, at the Gunnel House. Mars' personal one is a strange one too. Yeah, he. Um, so he's out. He's governor out in. Um, like he becomes secretary and acting governor out in the Montana Territory. He's going to drown in the Missouri River near Fort Benton on July the first, Canada Day, also anniversary of Gettysburg. 1867 and his body's never recovered so he kind of like he's one of these ones like um you know ambrose bierce it, we don't well, know it's a little it's a little more than that though yeah. you know because he while he was in montana he pissed off a lot of people i mean mm-hmm. like he pissed off a lot of people back in the old country and so he's gonna fall july 1st like it's 1867 he's gonna fall off the steamship at g.a thompson and drown like you said his body was never recovered but there are rumors 
that he was murdered by enemies in Montana, and he was killed by a man who was paid eight thousand dollars as a bounty. Who 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 basically in like nineteen thirteen fessed fessed up to it that he did it. Wow. But the death of Thomas Marr today remains one of history's greatest mysteries as far as whatever happened to him. But who knows? He pissed off the wrong person in Montana, yeah. and he got off. But who the hell knows? But the thing of the thing that you got to remember as we conclude this whole thing with the Irish Brigade, okay? Mm -hmm. In the Union Army, one in every four soldiers came from somewhere outside of this country, Germany, Canada, a lot from Irish. And it's it's clear that despite their motivation to fight, it's really hard to find another group who fought hard on the Irish Brigade because when you look at why they where they came from, their history, how they rallied, what they fought for, where they fought, how they fought, yeah. No brigade ever fought harder, in my opinion, than the Irish Brigade. So it's important, and it's important to remember them. Not just and it's again this the Irish Brigade, like the Iron Brigade, is not a is a very popular one. But when you really get into the weeds, into the clovers, as they say, and you study the Irish Brigade, and you learn the personal stories yeah. of Corcoran and Mar and all these guys we talk about, and all the men that they raised. Don't forget these; they were able to recruit guys. To fight for a country that hated them. Yeah. And they fought like Wolverines. They fought to the death. And when you look at Fredericksburg and you look at Antietam, even at Gettysburg, it's tough to find it's tough to find a division, I mean a brigade that fought harder. So I think yeah. I think it's an important study to study these guys and look at the history of what these guys came from. Um, and why some of these guys like the 69 still fight today. Yeah. And the remnants of them, they go right through to the end of the Civil War. They're there at Appomattox. Um, in eight in May of 1865, they are going to be part of the Grand Review in DC. What's left of these guys, where they've been, you know, kind of distributed in the AOP. Um, there was one thing that did happen in October 30th, um, 1864, that men from the 69th were signed to, assigned to picket duty opposite Fort Davis, which was a fortification they were defending at Petersburg, and in the middle of the night, a Confederate raiding party took the 69th by surprise. There was quite a few of them taken prisoner. They took some of the 111 New York that were right next to them, unfortunately taken prisoner as well. But this surprise raid prompted an investigation. Um, and in the investigation, it was discovered that 10 of their new recruits had deserted, gone over to the Confederates, and divulged the details of the placement of the Union pickets outside Fort Davis. So that was yeah. one thing that, that did happen to them near the end of the Civil War. But these guys, what's left of them, are just are kind of you know laid out you know distributed throughout the army of the Potomac. They are at some of them are at Appomattox. What's left of them? Um, yeah. In July fourth of eighteen sixty five, the Irish Brigade marches in a victory parade in New York City, um, and Mar did call upon the archdiocese to erect a cathedral and an Irish round tower in honor of them, but they never got this. Um, they did, however, get um, a monument at Antietam, and they have one at Gettysburg as well too and they're great monuments the one at gettysburg is is, is gorgeous as, as, as is the one in antietam so um interesting so about the one at gettysburg the sculptor um fought for the confederacy yeah there's so many cool little stories with this they, these these intertwine yeah. they go back and forth yeah i love the fact that mar was you know he was he was speaking in the south and he was doing all that stuff and it's just it's just so much that goes into this that it just really is well the reasons for fighting and and two this leads into our next episode um because we wanted to do obviously this is our union episode about ireland um for march and the irish brigade the union irish brigade but our next episode is going to be focused um on the confederate side and it is going to be an episode about general patrick claiborne and in him he's kind of embodying those like those hard fighting you know things that the Irish Brigade has as well. It tran it, it goes on to the other side as well. Um and he's obviously he's not Catholic, he's um Episcopalian, so the Protestant. Um and his experience like is is really, really interesting. But he's a guy that, you know, comes over here, makes America his home and decides to fight for the Confederacy because of where he is in Helena, Arkansas at the time the Civil War breaks out. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about him, and this is what I usually say, what's coming up for us? Yes, yeah. Mary, but you've, you jumped the gun on that one. Good job. No, Patrick Claiborne's an interesting study because we talk a lot about, about he didn't fight to 
learn and go back to Ireland to no. fight. He fought to fight for whatever home of his home. And it could have been Ohio, but it ends up being Arkansas, ends up being the South. And, and, and so he's a fascinating study. So we'll, we'll talk about him. So we'll get ready to drop that off. So we can drop this episode right now. So we, as we head off into the, the great, um, the great unknown here, but I think, yeah. I think it's a great study. I think this, this month is a great month um, to study a lot of these things and, and, and something Patrick Claiborne is going to be an eye opener with, with a lot of people as well, because yeah. I mean, he's somebody who, when you're talking clearly underrated guys who should oh. be bigger, yeah. and we're going to talk about that, that nativism issue we talked about with Washington, about how he's kind of keeping his head on Mars head, hand on Mars head is keeping down. We're going to see that clearly with Patrick Claiborne and the Confederacy. Yeah. So again, I've told you this before. I'll say it again. The Irish were treated very badly here mm-hmm. by, by in the United States, in the city I grew up in here, which is very heavily Irish. When you look at the history back in the day, 18, after the potato fan, 1850s, it was not well. But again, people take pride in it. I mean, Boston is a very Irish city, yeah. um, and uh, and they take pride in it as is New York City, as is parts of Philadelphia, um, even Chicago, sort of. But dying its river green. I guess what it is. Anyway, so let's drop it up here. So, so Patrick Claver is coming up for us next. So some things yeah. coming, some coming things coming for us. We're going to have our YouTube live tomorrow, yep. uh, Saturday, which is uh, which is exactly what it is tomorrow, and then we're going to um. We're going to be doing the episode on Claiborne. We got the book club. We're going to be announcing that here soon with some updates for that. We're going to be doing yeah. that. And we have a lot of other stuff coming for us. So, all right. So, any final words from you, you Canadian leprechaun? Well, thanks for bringing it like you always do with this. I learned a lot from you in this episode. So, thank you for that. Thank you to our listeners for supporting us for these last 124 episodes. We are on to 125 where we will talk mm-hmm. about General Patrick Claiborne. And remember, a city like Boston. It just tells you that the Boston College team is the real fighting Irish. Yeah. I'll tell you that right now. I'm sure Cor- off we, off. Father Corby would disagree with you. Okay. Uh, Father Corby's a PC reject. Anyway, <laughs> off we go. Guys, have a great weekend. Have a safe weekend. We'll hopefully see you on our YouTube live. Um, St. Patty's Day is still a few days away, so we'll have we'll have our Guinness then. But again, we will talk to you all soon. Mary, the pleasure, as always, is all yours. And we will talk to you all on the other side. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you all later. Bye.